Hey there and welcome back to another Miraculous Ladybug Season 4 review. And today I want to talk about the latest episode to drop, Penal Team, which is a football special. Because that's definitely something that's been missing from the show so far. Ugh, everything about this episode stinks of filler right from the get-go. Which kind of makes it a bit amusing that Asterix raged so hard about how you needed to watch this to properly understand elements of the finale, because as you can see, this episode hardly matters at all. But of course, with all that being said, let's jump into the review. So we start off the episode with Miss Bustier's class in a massive football stadium, preparing for what looks like a sports-related field trip, where they play a little game and a professional gives them tips. Makes sense, this kind of stuff happens all the time. But don't they usually hold these types of clinics at a little local sports ground or the park? This stadium's huge and looks to be in central Paris. I mean, what the hell? Hey, maybe I'm wrong, but where I live, you can't just go play on the pitch of a major stadium. They have training fields for that kind of thing. Like, maybe this is a thing in France. But I doubt it. Every proper professional stadium tour I've ever been on for school has had the groundskeeper watching like a hawk ready to kill you if you even look at a blade of grass wrong. I'm doubtful that they'd let these kids tarnish the turf with their practice game. But anyway, we see that Kim and Marinette are the team captains selecting their two teams, with Kim pulling a big brain move and selecting Max as his first pick to get access to Markov, who can run some statistical analysis, to decide who would be the best teammates to have. Although on the other hand, maybe he's taking a practice game with his class a little bit too seriously if you have to bring out the supercomputer to crunch some numbers. Anyway, then they have some exposition about learning to work together as a team. So, clearly that's going to be the moral of the story today. Also, did it bother anybody else that they kept calling it soccer and not football? Yeah, I know that America and some other countries, including Australia, call it soccer. And I know the dub's American, but the show is set in France. Football. Football. Say it right. It's not like anybody's going to get confused, especially when they're playing it. I feel like most people in the world know that the sport has two major names. It's such a small and kind of stupid gripe to have, I know, especially since my country does call it soccer as well, but it really just sets me off. Call it football when you're in France, please. Anyway though, let's move on with the episode, because at this point, the class tries to think of the fairest way to choose teams, with suggestions being girls versus boys, and another being the alphabetical order of the names of their teddy bears. Which of course gets shot down, because only Rose still has a teddy. And hold up now. I'm feeling a bit attacked here, Alia. Don't teddy shame me. Are you telling me that nobody keeps their childhood teddy at all? You just throw it in the bin? Was it just me that kept it? I would legit rather swim naked through the Arctic Circle than dispose of my beautiful Paddington teddy. What's up with all this slander? Moving on though, we get a very rare Mark and Nathaniel scene where Mark's trying to drag Nathaniel into the stadium to participate in the field trip. So is this the weekend? Is this during school hours? Is Nathaniel just going to be like, no, nah, I'm not going to school? And he's getting Mark, who's not in the class, to go in there and say, oh, Nathaniel's sick or whatever. I mean, what even is this? Anyway though, we conveniently skip the excuse so that the writers don't have to think of anything, and then Mark's almost roped in, but tries to back out of it due to self-confidence issues. But when he's passing the ball to the guy, he for some reason flicks it up, juggles it a bit, and then passes it backwards through his legs. Like, who the hell even does something like that? He just asks for the ball. Oh no, I'm so bad at sports, he says as he clearly shows off how good at sports he is. What a dweeb. Nobody likes a show off. Especially when they lay on the false modesty act. For shame, Mark. Anyway, they start up the match, and it turns out that Sabrina's actually really good at football. So what do you know? Character development, I guess. But unfortunately, Adrian is beyond trash, because he picks up the ball. Now this scene, it was funny. I did laugh. But also a bit cringe, and it's up there with Clown Marinette, and the infamous statue scene for me. I mean, just look at Nino's face. It's just so awkward. But anyway, it doesn't even make sense. I mean, I get that they say that Adrian somehow doesn't know the rules, but that doesn't make any sense to me. For one, he's been watching everybody play so far and nobody's picked up the ball, so wouldn't he think, ooh, I don't know the rules, so I'd probably better do what they do. But then on top of that, football is France's most popular sport, so how could he not know the most basic rule of the sport? He has a TV, doesn't he? Has he never flicked on a match before? Never ever, not once? 
I know that in the dub they call it soccer, but let's be real, realistically, in canon, he would know it as football. The name didn't clue him in. He has a foosball table in his room. The little foosball men only use their feet or their head. And then on top of that, we see him play the sport properly in Furious Foo. He even screams, GOAL, after he scores. So he clearly is familiar with the sport if he can mimic what the commentators do when their national team scores in the World Cup. I mean, I get that it's a joke because Adrian's meant to be completely inept socially because homeschool, <laughs> get it? Homeschool so funny, he's such an idiot. But really, it's just frustrating when it goes against canon within the same season. Jesus Christ, I know I'm getting heated, but how hard is it to remember what's in your own show? Or for anybody to remember? I mean, this is a team of writers making this. Are they this inept at show lore? It's very worrying. Moving on though, at this point, Chloe decides that she has no interest in playing this sport at all and tries to leave, only for Miss Bustier to tell her to get stuffed and get back in line. Because this is happening during school hours. In which case, why the hell did she encourage Mark to stay and play? He was right, this isn't his class. I feel like this just goes against the policy of any school at all. You can't just accept stragglers. And on top of that, shouldn't this mean that she should have needed Nathaniel's parents to sign off on him not being here? Not just the word of this random student that isn't even in their class? Am I the crazy person here? What if Nathaniel Skippian gets hit by a car or abducted on the way home? That'd be liable. Doesn't she have a duty of care? Isn't Miss Bustier meant to be smart? Come on now. Anyway though, Chloe asks why she can't sit on the bench with Lila, who's currently faking an injury. And I gotta ask, why would you even come if you didn't want to play? I mean, it's clear that they were supposed to come here by themselves. I mean, Nathaniel did. So why did she just not ditch? Is she there for sympathy points? Like, what's going on here, Lila? And so Chloe tries to fake an injury, but gets denied. And then the guest coach guy signs off on using Chloe as a handicap for each team. And I mean, I know she's a brat, but this seems like a bit too harsh for educators, right? If she's making such a fuss, just sit her out. There's no need to include it in such a passive aggressive way. And then praise Marinette for having the idea? Dank. This is bullying. Oh, she's the handicap. And of course, this then leads to Chloe getting akumatized on purpose into penalty. Who forms the penal team. <laughs> Good puns, guys, right? Guys? Guys? Ugh. Anyway, this is one of the weirdest, most smooth-brained Gabe plans of all time. Because why the hell would he want a big dome? Isn't the whole point to capture Cat Noir and Ladybug? What if they weren't inside the dome? Would she just be playing football by herself for eternity? Good one, Gabe. And speaking of smooth brains, for some reason, the students actually try to play against her. And it's like, why? Why would you do this? Why would you compete against a super-powered villain team? Didn't they notice how she disposed of Miss Bustier? Lame. Literally every other time somebody gets akumatized, everybody runs away. Why would this be different? It felt like it was just to get rid of Alia early because she isn't meant to have her miraculous anymore. And then she gets rid of Alex and this other random guy, and it's only after that that everybody thinks, oh yeah, I'd better run away. So basically, everybody that can't get a miraculous needs to be gotten rid of. Excellent plot convenient writing. Minus five stars. And at this point, we actually have a ray of sunshine in this storm of mediocrity, as Ladybug declares that her and Cat Noir are gonna take down Chloe's team by themselves. To which Cat Noir reveals, oh, he's trash at football, with the commentator saying he's not champion material. And oof, poor Cat Noir taking the L today, but that scene did actually give me a good giggle, so I didn't mind too much. So Ladybug leaves Cat Noir to tend the goals while she goes and collects their super team. And I gotta ask, how the hell did she have time to go and find Luca, Kagami, and Zoe? Like, what? How does she even know where they are? Sure, Zoe's in the year below them, so she just has to go to the school, but what if she's in class? Ladybug can't just bust in there and be like, I need Zoe now. I mean, that would just mess up the whole secret identity thing. And it's not like she can hide in the toilet for an hour. What's going on here? Does she just have a pager where they can send messages to the other holders to meet her in certain locations? I think it would have been nice if they'd set up and shown a system of how all this works so we don't have to pretend like logic doesn't matter anymore. I mean, what even is this? 
And that's not even counting where Luca and Kagami are. Because doesn't Luca either go to a different school, is in the year above them, or doesn't go to school anymore? And Kagami, is she not homeschooled? Is that not a thing? And doesn't she have a super overprotective and clingy mum too? Good luck getting her away from her. Also, what are the chances they're just going to be conveniently located within the dome? Why even bother having them this episode? After all, they were going to introduce new heroes anyway. It just feels a bit unnecessary. Anyway, though, we get our new heroes, the rooster with Mark, the dog with Sabrina, the ox to Ivan, and the goat to Nathaniel. And we don't even see them power up. Lame. And my god, did they really use one of those randomizer websites to make their names? Miss Hound? Rooster Bold? I mean, I know it's a DC reference, but it's still truly bad. Capri Kid? Man Torox? Just a deep, visceral feeling of cringe. You can just tell, looking at them and hearing their names, these are filler characters that you will never see again. Anyway, we then have a football montage in the stadium where Luca gets eliminated like the filler character that he is now, and Nino gets sent flying through the city before they move on to the next arena, which the episode tells us is all of Paris. But I mean, they're clearly still inside the dome, which is very obviously not all of Paris. I mean, look at all of that extra city outside of it. And then for some reason, Ladybug, The Guardian, the expert planner who in almost every episode is the one person that uses her teammates' strengths to her advantage. The mastermind. She suddenly becomes a glory hog who's not going to pass the ball. Yeah. I'm not buying it. Oh, and Adrian scores an own goal. <sighs> I mean, there's no way he thought that was a good idea. This is just pure character assassination at this point. So yeah, the hero team gets thoroughly spanked and are 12 goals behind by half time. And just watch, just watch them beat Chloe's team in like under a minute of episode time. Just watch. And oh, oh, what do you know? I was almost right. The second half starts off around 1528 in episode time. And they technically win the match by 1636. So it's only a little bit over a minute. Congratulations. Honestly, with a script like this, I'd be surprised if the episode doesn't get nominated for an Emmy. It's just gold standard. But wait, there's more, because Chloe is a sore loser and so the match continues, but without Cat Noir, because he's no longer important. Shuffle off into your bubble, mate. And he also sucks at football, so who cares? So instead, they need to get her to reject the Akuma. But wait, can't the horse guy just open a portal and grab the object from inside its bubble? Was that not possible? Did Marinette not do this exact thing in Senti Bubbler? Or at least something similar? Or are the characters just dumbed down for this episode. Anyway though, the game's back on, but this time the goal is to make Chloe rage quit, which is actually a good plan because it happens often and easily. And they succeed by tricking her into thinking that their powers are going to last forever. And this was actually a smart bit of writing, honestly. Credit where credit's due. It doesn't salvage the episode, but it was smart nonetheless. Also, the rooster power is so OP, it makes Marinette look foolish for never handing it out before. It's seriously just such a broken ability. Oh well. Anyway, King Monkey then messes with Chloe's power and she quits the game. And at long last, it's finally over. And whilst this episode is one of those I would never ever watch again, I did enjoy Chloe's meltdown at the end. She did shine this episode as a villain. Oh, and then they have this team up with Lila right at the end that leads into Risk. And so why was Asterix mad that this aired after Risk? This moment is so, so small and adds almost nothing that it doesn't matter anyway. Oh well. So yeah, that's the end of the episode. And now I will go and lie down and try to forget. This is one of those episodes that nobody, nobody should ever have to watch again. It has to be the worst of the season. Maybe the worst of all time. And I mean, I usually try to find the good in all the episodes. I really do. But this was too much even for me. And that's sad because I enjoy shows and movies about sports, but they didn't even make the football exciting. It was more just a minor setting because Thomas wanted it this way. This whole scenario could have happened in any setting. It doesn't matter. The football doesn't matter. And now it's just some weird meme-worthy sports special. Why does it have to exist? <sighs> but as always, those were just my opinions. And now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the episode? Like it? Hate it? Make sure to leave a comment and let me know.